Ya, así, bien, perdón. So greetings to everybody who is here. I am so glad to welcome everyone, both our presenters who are here and to all of the participants to this discussion. I am Leslie Alsop. I am an assistant professor at Pediatrics and Women's Health Department at UNT Health Science Center. And I am a faculty partner for Asthma 411 Services at Safer Care Texas, who are our host today. I see this discussion as a celebration. On just May 22nd, legislation was signed that aligns our Texas policy with national best practice recommendations. And in just over three weeks later, we are having a conversation to begin partnering on turning policy into improvements for children with asthma. So first, we'll start with the usual housekeeping. And I am having a screen advance issue here. Um, I am having a screen advance issue. And while that's solved, I'm just going to mention that this is being um, live share uh, screened. Uh, we're recording it as well today. And we will have an opportunity as we go through to enter any questions and comments you have in the Q&A box. Um, of course, the views and the opinions that are expressed by speakers are their own rather than HSC. And with that, I'm going to have the great pleasure of introducing our speakers today. First, we have our national speakers. That is Dr. Lynn Gerald and Dr. Anna Fullerman. Um, Dr. Gerald is an assistant vice chancellor for population health science at University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Fullerman is on the faculty and the Department of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at University of Chicago. Um, both of these individuals are widely published experts in their field, and they both held leadership roles in developing the national recommendations for unassigned albuterol pop, um, policy that have been published and endorsed and that our policy in Texas now aligns with. I want to thank them both. Um, for their leadership in the field and their many contributions over the years. Not only have they provided leadership in constructing these recommendations, but also in constructing the knowledge base that these recommendations are grounded in. And they've been consulting with us throughout our, um, our process in, in Texas. I also am delighted to introduce our partners and presenters here in Texas. I'm gonna start with Dr. Folashade Afalabe, who is a pediatric pulmonology at UT Southwestern. Um, and Dr. Afalabe reached out to me shortly after those uh, recommendations were published in fall of 2021. And together we co-convened this effort to, to make the change that we're celebrating and moving forward today with the wonderful partners uh, that we've had a chance to work with. Um, Dr. Afalabe will lead our discussion section from 1 to 1.30. We're also delighted to have Charlie Kagan with us from the American Lung Association in Texas in Oklahoma. Charlie is gonna give us an overview of the tremendous work he's done in the halls of Austin for school health policy, both allergy and asthma um, related over the past several years. Becca Harkle Road from Texas School Nurse Organization will bring her expertise to tie this policy to school health services across the state of Texas. And I will wrap up with some comments about Asthma 411, the wonderful partnership that we have in Tarrant County, and then some resources that can be used by everyone. Now, what I wish is that we could have introductions for everybody who has joined us here today and is a part of this conversation. Since we can't do this, we're opening a poll now. 
And hopefully you will see that and just describe to us what best describes your role in improving asthma outcomes for children. What brought you here, whether that is a K-12 school, you're in a, a hospital or health network, higher education, government, community, or an individual. Um, and as we um, get that information, it's going to just help us to understand who's participating in our conversation today. All right, wonderful. With all of that in place, I am going to move forward and turn this over uh, to Charlie Kagan, and who will lead our overview of, of these legislative efforts for children uh, at school with allergy and asthma. Thank you, Charlie. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. Um, hey folks, Charlie Gagan here, Advocacy Director with the American Lung Association. Um, and I know we're having some slide issues, but just bear with us. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit about the, the history of kind of how we got here. Um, it was um, only a, a few years ago that EpiPens were introduced into schools to allow uh, school personnel and school nurses particularly to help save kids' lives in emergency situations. It was 2015, Senate Bill 66, uh, and it was by no means a unanimous decision. There were six Senate no votes um, on that bill just to add epinephrine auto injectors into public school campuses. Um, but soon after that policy went into effect, um, lawmakers quickly understood the benefits um, and it quickly became a, a near unanimous bipartisan effort to help address emergency situations in schools, particularly around kids. And so we saw after 20, 2015 continuous improvements to these laws. So in 2017, um, there was a bill that added private schools to be included um, to have epinephrine auto injectors. Fast forward two years later in 2019 was the first time we started talking about as a medicine uh, on school campuses. And so House Bill 2243 passed unanimously out of both chambers and essentially added prescription as a medication um, to the existing statutes and laws around epinephrine. It was limited, um, but it added and created that structure for uh, that we were able to, to build on. In 2021, there was an effort to expand this policy. Um, uh, the 2019 bill was very limiting in that it limited it to only nurses could administer the medication and only students with an existing known asthma diagnosis could receive that. Um, in 2021, we started to have the conversation of how can we expand this to ensure that every kid having respiratory distress on a school campus or anyone for that matter can receive emergency medication. And so House Bill 3819 didn't quite make it all the way um, but started to, to have that conversation with lawmakers about maybe we should expand it to not just nurses, to any trained school per personnel. And so when 2023 rolled around, or really 2022 was when our work group started working together. Um, we had the new guidelines that had just come out. And we said, hey, instead of kind of chipping away at this, let, let's make it as expansive as possible. Let's try to get the best ideal policy. Um, and so that's the, the legislation and bill we shared with lawmakers. And that's fortunately what is now law today in Texas. So we can go ahead in the next slide. Um, so we had uh, two bills, Senate Bill 294 and House Bill 920. Um, both bills received excellent hearings and, and a strong outpouring of community support. And I particularly want to thank and highlight the individuals in the photo here, Dr. Dan Dean, Leslie Alsop, Becca Harkaro, Dr. Shade Afalabe, um, and everyone else who, who came out and participated. As you see here, we had in addition to several letters of support from community organizations like the Allergy and Asthma Network and Texas Society for Respiratory Care, we had numerous folks show up to turn out to either speak or put in cards of support during those committee hearings. We were also able to collect uh, uh, more than 100, I think 126 signatures for an individual letter of support that we regularly shared with lawmakers. And it showed um, when these bills were heard in committee hearing, uh, there were great questions um, from lawmakers help trying to understand the policy better. There were comments of this is a common sense bill that will save kids lives. And as a result, uh, it ended up passing both the House and the Senate uh, with unanimous votes. And so we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so again, thanks to that strong community support, there, there were no opponents to this bill. It really was presented as this is a common sense way to help save kids lives. And so this was a graph we shared with lawmakers that just showed how Texas had, had several gaps, how we needed to improve the law. As you can see here, there were four main categories where Texas was lacking uh, when it came to the national standards. This include uh, allowing any student to receive medication, not just those with an asthma diagnosis, 
uh, restricting it to just students instead of anyone on a school campus, uh, addressing whether only a, a trained school nurse can administer or any trained personnel, um, and then an issue of permission. You know, did, did the school need to get explicit written permission or could they act in good faith considering these are emergency situations? And I'm pleased to announce that we were able to close all four of these loopholes and Texas now has model policy similar to Illinois, Indiana, and Arizona in terms of the expansiveness of this policy. And so I'll now hand it over to my, my great colleague, Becca Harkle Road with the School Nurse Organization to elaborate further as to what this means for schools. But again, just wanted to thank all of our many collaborators uh, for getting this across the finish line. Thanks, Charlie. My name is Becca Harkle Road. I'm the advocacy chair for Texas School Nurses Organization. And we are just so excited that Senate Bill 294 passed. Like Charlie said, this has been an effort um, going back a long ways. This group started meeting and working together and we're so excited for the outcome. Um, as you see there, Senate Bill 294 is the bill that passed. And just like Charlie did a great job of explaining what all it does, right? It allows us to administer albuterol, albuterol to anybody with respiratory distress symptoms, regardless of whether or not we have a diagnosis on file, because sometimes what you see in the clinic is somebody who's having respiratory distress, but they don't have a diagnosis of asthma and they may not need a diagnosis of asthma. It could be, um, there are a number of other causes it could be unrelated to, um, to asthma. It also, like Charlie said, allows us to train non-nurse staff to administer stock albuterol. And I think this is really important, not just because the school nurse cannot is sometimes out and we can't find a sub, but more than 10% of counties in Texas don't even have a school nurse anywhere in the county. A lot of those areas are rural. And um, that means also that EMS response times are very long in those areas. And for our schools who don't have a school nurse to at least have this one toolbox, tool in their toolbox to just help buy some time um, for those kids until EMS can get there with their response. We're very excited about that. Um, also, it, this law will ensure that someone is available during school hours to administer uh, the stock albuterol. And during school hours is either defined as bell to bell or 30 minutes outside of each bell. But it also has a provision that will allow it to be administered anytime outside of those hours or anytime during a field trip or something that's off campus, um, sporting events or anything else off campus, they can carry this albuterol and administer it. Then let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide. Um, okay, go ahead. Okay, so, We've got a bill and it becomes a law. That's great. I'm going to walk you guys through. I don't know if everybody is familiar with the process. So we've gotten from bill to law. I'm not even going to go over that part of what happens at the Capitol. I'm going to look now at everything that happens from when it gets on the books until what it looks like for the school district. And then in a minute, we're going to talk about what that means for our nurses and our nurse administrators. So like, like Charlie said, Senate Bill 294 makes changes to Section 38, Subchapter E of the Texas Education Code. What that means is any changes that are in TEC are going to be updated. And when TASB, their uh, school law section, when they update policy, um, in Texas schools, policy is law. So the legal interpretation of the policy is one thing that's adopted by the school board. And then anything that makes it pertinent to your school district is in the local policy, again, adopted by the school board. So this is going from Senate Bill 294 into TEC Chapter 38. Now it will be implemented into uh, school board policy, FFAC. Um, and the good news about the changes that we're making, like Charlie said, is we've already got somewhat of a provision for schools to have stock albuterol in certain situations. And having the robust epi laws that are aligned um, with the national standards for albuterol also helps. We've already got a lot of this language. It's not going to take a long time to come up with this stuff. Right. So it's in 
EDU, now it gets put in board policy, like I said, in FFAC legal and local. And so now when it gets to the district level and the board has approved that, now district employees are tasked with creating the actual strategies. Um, a lot of districts will include this as a regulation and all the paperwork that goes with it as an exhibit into those policies as well. Um, and this is a great this is a great time for schools and school districts to collaborate with each other. So nobody is having to start from scratch because these things already exist. These are practices that are already in motion with stock epi and stock albuterol in certain circumstances. So you don't have to start from scratch. There are plenty of resources that can help you with this, um, including things for the implementation, like tra training components, slides, videos, handouts. There's all kind of great information. And then schools just need to remember that they are notifying parents that this is something that we have on campus and something that we will be able to offer. And that can go in with all of your other required notifications in your back to school packets. Most of the time those things are listed in the student handbook. Okay, so now we've looked at the, the laws and where the language goes. Let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about what this means for school nurses and school nurse administrators to actually, uh, to actually implement this stuff. So really and truly your school nurses can start when the board policy is starting. Have those conversations, collaborate with them, find out when are we gonna have a meeting that updates this policy? Do I need to be there? Do you guys have any questions? What are your thoughts on certain things, right? You also, once it gets there, you're going to already need to be ready to hit the ground running because you're going to need to do training. So it's really important. You decide who are we going to train? Are we going to train by title? Are we going to train by role? Are we going to choose individuals by name? Who are we going to train? What kind of training will it be? Will it be on online, in person with a, or online with a an in-person skills follow-up or the whole thing in person? What are we going to do when and where are we going to do this during back to school? Is it going to be an after school training after school starts? Um, what do we need? Like I said, let's go back to when we were talking about the exhibits and the regulations have that paperwork in place. And some of that can include a, your your signature pages where, hey, you've got this sign page that says, yes, I've been trained. And either at the bottom of that page or on another one, say, Yes, I'm aware that this is a law and I'm signing that I'm willing to stand up and do this role, right? So starting documentation with the training piece, you want to document who's trained and who's agreed to do this. And then you're going to have to document when you implement this, you need to have forms, you need to have a strategy in place because the reporting requirements will go, will be through the Department of State Health Services, DSHS. And it will be very similar to Stock Epi. So it would be a great idea to have a document that you fill out, and that's what you use to fill out that, um, that information online. Now, another thing that I hope we're going to talk about soon, um, and maybe later in the presentation, is being able to get your hands on a standing delegation order to have this um, pr medication prescribed to your school district and assigned per students, and then to be able to obtain these inhalers and spacers. It's really fascinating, the reusable slash disposable spacers um, that are out there now that are actually um, endorsed by the Asthma and Allergy Institutes and Thoracic Society and AAP. Um, I'm not even going to go into nebulizers because I know most schools in Texas have gotten away from nebs because of COVID considerations. And there's an abundance of data and research showing how the, the inhaler with spacer is the preferred way to go for this program. And so we've got our training lined out. We've got our people trained. We've got our documentation ready. We've got our standing order and we've got our products in hand. Now we've got the green light. It's time to implement this program. So your nurse admin and your school district need to make sure that every campus has the tools, the training, and the confidence they need to respond in such a way to prevent a catastrophic emergency on their campus. 
Um, I'm really excited. I hope that kind of covers from where we started to where we are now. And I am very excited to hand it over to Dr. Bowlerman um, with my thanks to her and Dr. Gerald for all of their support and input while we were updating our standards to match what they have already gone through and put forth. So I have just stopped sharing and um, thank you so much, Becca and Charlie and Dr. Vollerman. We'll look forward to um, hearing from you and uh, Dr. Gerald uh, with this national perspective and expertise. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you for uh, you guys hear me I keep being muted. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited to be here to talk a little bit um, about um, the, um, the, the uh, national guidelines as they relate to implementation. And then I will turn it over to Dr. Gerald um, to discuss um, uh, kind of uh, examples um, and lessons learned in the process. So um, I'm just going to walk through um, the guidelines for unassigned albuterol as it relates to implementation. Just as a reminder, this document is publicly available. Um, it is a, a part of a policy statement that was put out by the American Thoracic Society, the Allergy and Asthma Network, um, the American Lung Association, and the Nas National Association of School Nurses. And it's a meaty document, so there's lots of information in there about um, implementation. And I encourage individuals, um, you know, to, to go to the document to see the details um, um, and to kind of read through all of the um, nitty gritty. Um, what I will touch on is um, just various components for implementation. So now that this legislation has passed, typically states will um, either create or update kind of the, the regulations that, that um, kind of uh, the regulations that are supporting that legislation, which tends to provide much more of like the nitty gritty. Um, um, with it um, needs to come several things, right? Um, one is just dissemination and education about the policy. Two is training of school personnel to be ready to implement. Um, three is considering supplies um, that are necessary for the program. Four is considering the protocols. Um, and five is also thinking about the procedures that follow um, the use of undesignated albuterol, um, which are important for thinking about how is this program implemented and, and next steps. So let's walk through each one. It is um, critical to, to broadly um, disseminate this policy and key audiences are both healthcare providers in and outside of school settings um, so that they know that this is a resource that is available and yet understand that this isn't something that should substitute regular and appropriate medical care for, um, for asthma or for respiratory issues. The policy should also be disseminated to school staff, ranging from, of course, the districts and administrative levels who will be doing some of those key pieces to implement it, um, but also the day-to-day -day staff, right? The office staff, the office clerks, teachers, et cetera, so that everyone knows about it and knows what it means um, and how it can be applied, just like we disseminate information about um, stock epi, for example. Um, and then, of course, to families so that they know that this is a resource, but this does not substitute regular care. Um, in addition to that initial dissemination of policy, it's critical to provide annual education and communication about um, the, the types of programs, um, the fact that um, you know it is there um, and a resource that is available um, um, as, as an emergency response. Um, and then there's a wide variety of individuals who can help with dissemination, and these are um, you know stakeholders and partners to think about um, in developing materials. Um, in thinking about um, groups where this information should be shared or newsletters that it could be shared with. Next is the training of um, school personnel. And I would say that school nurses are, um, you know, a, a key group to involve here because they can both provide the training um, on undesignated albuterol and or facilitate training. Um, so if there is training available uh, electronically or through a web system, um, it is still important to have that person um, locally that knows about how this will be implemented and can answer questions on a day-to-day -day basis. And so um, uh, school nurses can be a key group in that regard. 
um, important considerations for training school personnel. We recommend that there's at least two individuals trained per building. And specifically we say per building rather than per school because we acknowledge that certain buildings have more than one, certain schools may have more than one building. Um, additional considerations, we say a minimum of two individuals because one might be sick or absent or on vacation or um, have, a, have a day off. And so it's important that at least one person is trained in the building. Um, but that's a really a minimum. And the more individuals that can be trained and, and know about it, the better. Um, also, it's important to acknowledge that schools are set up in different ways. Um, and schools that have large populations, student populations, high rates of asthma prevalence, um, or campuses that, you know, don't facilitate, uh, easily facilitate the movement of staff. Um, it would be important to have more than two individuals trained and that should be considered by school. The ratio that we've um, kind of uh, provided as a guideline is one trained individuals for every 225 students. And then here you can see a list of key aspects um, that should be included in the training. So basic understanding of asthma and how it works, what quick relief medications are, how to recognize different levels of respiratory distress, making sure the individual knows correct techniques so that they can either provide it to the child um, and or um, support the child using it properly, um, determining what should happen after the event, um, and then kind of key pieces about maintaining the devices and also uh, post-incident uh, instructions. Key program supplies to, inc to, conclude, to include or to consider that need to be obtained um, include the actual albuterol, we recommended an ometer dose inhaler, um, and again, I'm happy to discuss the, the benefits and the utility of inhalers versus nebulizers, um, um, but really with um, the recent pandemic and uh, um, with best practices uh, for um, albuterol um, and asthma care, um, a meter doses inhaler is recommended. It's also important to have a supply of one-way val one valve holding chambers. So, um, typically, you only need one inhaler per school, um, but that it's important to have multiple one-way valve holding chambers um, because you need one of those per child. Alcohol wipes are important to be able to clean the materials and then also template documents. And there's a variety of template documents that are needed, which we'll get into in a, in a moment. It is critical to identify who will be providing the standing medical order and the prescription that's needed for these devices. Um, this will vary based on where um, an individual resides um, or is present um, and individuals to consider would include like local public health departments. If there is a physician or a prescribing um, individual, a health officer um, at the school district, um, it can also include uh, physicians at local um, hospitals or health facilities and those partnerships can be really important to support that. Um, in addition, funding must be considered. You, we do need, we, you, the schools need funding um, to support these types of programs, but really the funding is quite minimal when we think about the potential benefits um, and are, you know, can be leveraged either as, um, as part of school budget or could be leveraged at a state level um, or through partnerships with um, health systems or uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, standardized protocols are important, and these should include the instructions for the use of undesignated albuterol. So what are the signs and symptoms, um, the course of action that should be taken when EMS and emergency medical care should be summoned, um, the doses to give, um, uh, number of puffs based in different scenarios, what should happen after. Um, and then also there should be documentation after an incident occurs, and so what are the protocols for maintaining that? At. These protocols can be developed at a state level, and I know in Illinois we've developed um, a, a statewide protocol that can be used, and then districts can uh, work off of that and adapt that as needed for their local environment. Um, additional documents beyond the standardized protocol to consider would be just an instruction sheet about the implementation, um, template letters to use for communication, both at the, at the staff level, but also at the, with families. Um, it's often helpful to have an immediate resource with directions and graphics about how to use um, uh, meter dose inhalers effectively, any documentation forms or logs that need to be completed afterwards, um, as well as we recommend a copy of um, having the, the regulation um, or and the, the law of the statute readily available. 
Um, and then in terms of thinking about documentation or what should happen after um, an individual receives um, and, and the stock albuterols um, um, uh, administered, um, this is the list of um, uh, things that we recommend um, ensuring that are on that form. Um, so when and where um, the event occurred, um, who responded um, and their role, um, who received the medication, their age, their gender, their race, their ethnicity, whether it is known that they previously had asthma, the reason for the use, um, whether it was certain symptoms, whether it's, um, and what type of symptoms specifically, the number of um, puffs or um, medication that was given, um, what happened to the student after is really important because that's gonna be important to evaluate the program and understand how it played out. Um, and then what communication occurred afterwards, both with families um, and then any other comments, right? And that could be other communication that occurred with the healthcare provider, or it could be um, more details about any of the questions listed above. Um, some additional considerations, and this will be really based and related to the state policy, is, um, you know, will there be different approaches if if the, if the state legislation is supports undesignated albuterol for children only versus children and adults, will there be different procedures for children and adults? We talked about the use of inhalers versus nebulizers, um, and that's an important consideration. And then also just thinking about stack albuterol and the coronavirus, um, as well as other viruses and illnesses. Um, and, and that's part of the recommendation for the um, inhaler, but also just thinking about, um, you know, um, minimizing any sort of infectious um, uh, aspects uh, that may occur. Um, I think these are among one of these are three of many additional considerations and questions that arise. Um, and this process of developing and implementing and evaluating, um, you know, an undesignated albuterol program is something that occurs over the course of uh, weeks and months um, and, you know, really should be tailored to the local environment while keeping in mind these best practices. So um, um, just take home points, um, albuterol safe and has potential to be life-saving. It's really critical to disseminate this policy to stakeholders and engage them early um, for effective implementation. Um, and that funding really should be considered along with all the uh, necessary pieces in terms of supplies and documents um, to ensure success. Um, and I will stop share there and turn it over to Dr. Gerald uh, for the next piece of um, implementation. Thank you, Anna. Let me. I'm having. All right, there we go. Well, let's go back to the beginning. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bolleman, for uh, presenting the guidelines. Um, I just want to congratulate your team that really has been leading this effort. You know, Leslie and Charlie and Shade and Becca. Um, I mean, this is amazing that you've been able to adapt the legislation to get it in line with the guidelines and do so so quickly. And I will say we have seen success around the country with these programs, and it's really it's saving lives, but even more so it's improving quality of life for children because most of these children that get um, stock albuterol at school are able to go right back to the classroom. So it's really making a huge difference. I'm gonna talk a little bit um, briefly about the implementation that we did in 2017, 2018 uh, in an entire county in Arizona. This was, is where the city of Tucson is. Um, we were one of the first states to do wide scale implementation. And I will say we learned a lot from implementation and hopefully we can help you um, by sharing some of our successes and failures. Um, and then I've also been working with states around the country, um, including Illinois, Dr. Volodymyr, Vollerman and I are very involved in that. Illinois is the first state in the country to actually, um, the legislature has put funding towards implementation. So we're very excited about that as well. Um, but we passed our law in spring of 2017. So we tried to implement um, in the county, Pima County, which is in Southern Arizona. You can see on this map, it's where Tucson is located and where um, I was a faculty member at that time. And so our first wide scale implementation was the 2017, 2018 school year. To give you an idea of how we implemented, um, this was actually one of my uh, MSPH students. It was her thesis. 
Um, she had no idea what a big project she was taking on. And so I would say, you know, it's about a 50% effort of one person, um, which was her, um, and then support from me for training and um, phone support from schools when they needed. And we did either a web or an in-person training. So we had the web training available, but we did in-person as much as possible. And the reason I'm telling you some of these things is I'll come back to where how I think some of our implementation processes affected our successes and failures. So we have 339 schools in this county and we were able to enroll 229, so about 68% of them. And you can see that we um, got most of our public schools to participate and then fewer charter and private schools. Um, basically, it's just a, a lot more difficult to outreach these organizations because um, they're more individualized, whereas you know, we could reach out to one district and get you know, 25 schools. Um, but we feel like we covered about 82% of children in the county during the school year. And you can see the, um, the light air um, disposable spacer that Becca mentioned in her talk um, here in this picture. And it has just been um, really wonderful for this program because it's inexpensive. It also folds down flat and it's very easy for schools to store. So it doesn't take up a lot of space. And it doesn't have to be cleaned. Um, we have research that shows it can, you can use it for a year in a school-based setting for that individual child. There's a place to write that child's name on the spacer. And as long as the spacer doesn't get wet or it doesn't have any visible tearing, it can be used for the entire school year. So just a, a little bit of outcome data from our first implementation. We had about 66% of schools who reported using the stock inhaler at least once. We had over a thousand events during that school year. 80% of these events were in children with a known diagnosis of asthma, even though the legislation does allow for, um, you know, for all respiratory distress, which is incredibly important because you can see that 20% of these events were in children that did not have a known diagnosis of asthma. Many of these ended up getting a diagnosis at some later point in time, um, but that was one of the important changes that you were able to make to your legislation. The mean puffs administered was 2.7, and I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. But one of the most important things you can see is that 84% of children who use the stock inhaler were able to return to class. So this is a huge improvement in quality of life. You know, our school health staff will tell you that prior to the stock inhaler program, if a child had respiratory distress and they, they didn't have to have a personal inhaler, the only thing they could do was call 911 if it was bad enough or call the parent to come and get the child. So this is really um, an important um, and impactful program for children. There were about seven and a half events per 1,000 students. So, you know, a pretty high rate of events. The event rates were not higher among any age group or any type of school. Um, the only thing we saw that was different among schools was that younger children were more likely to be sent home after using the stock inhaler. And we can, you know, after talking to parents and children, we think that this is um, mainly because um, it's obviously respiratory distress is a very scary event. Um, it's even more scary for young children who, uh, you know, are not as used to having asthma attacks. It's also very scary for their parents. And then occasionally with a large dose of albuterol, the children would be a little bit jittery and um, would need to go home. But um, overall, as you saw, most children were able to go back to class. And as Dr. Volerman mentioned, the cost per school um, for us were $156 per school, but that includes the cost of our 50% program coordinator. So that was really the largest cost. So an individual school should be able to do this for about $85 um, of cost to the school. So what were some of the things that we learned or some of the implications for implementation after this first year? So Dr. Voloman talked about how the guidelines now talk about the importance of disseminating this policy to everybody. And I think this is one of the things that we learned the hard way. Um, you know, when a new law passes, it takes a long time for people to learn about that law. And so I want to talk about three groups uh, specifically that you should probably focus on trying to get some information about the law out that caused um, some issues for us. Um, first of all, lack of knowledge among primary care practitioners or anybody who treats children with asthma. So we had several instances where the school health staff um, treated the child appropriately with albuterol um, at school, and then the parent ended up following up with their physician. In, in one case, this was a child that didn't have a diagnosis of asthma. The parent followed up with a primary care practitioner. Um, 
telling the primary care practitioner what had happened at school. The primary care practitioner picked up the phone, called the school and said, what are you doing? You can't give albuterol to a child that doesn't have asthma. This is illegal. And, you know, obviously these school health, your school health staff are working really um, diligently. They were doing the right thing. Um, and this is something we could have avoided. I ended up talking to the primary care practitioner, explaining the law. Um, but this is something we could have avoided if we had tried a little harder to get out some information to the, the individuals that care for children with asthma. So it was just a misunderstanding again. So making sure that primary care practitioners and urgent care facilities have information about the law and what schools are now allowed to do. We also found the same issues with uh, lack of knowledge among our EMS providers. We had an issue when 911 was called to the school for respiratory distress for a child that had asthma and the school had given um, a significant amount of albuterol per protocol. They had done everything correctly, but they were fussed at by the EMS providers because the EMS providers were not aware of the law. And again, um, because there was really just me and my student implementing it, we had to do this um, after the fact. But if you, and so I was able to call the EMS providers, explain what had happened. Um, but if you can address these going forward, it makes life a lot easier for, for any schools that are implementing the program. And then the same thing, um, we had lack of knowledge among our pharmacists. So when schools would try to, um, they get a standing medical order and they get a prescription from a physician and they try to fill it at a pharmacy, pharmacists were not um, aware of the new law that said they could, they could fill a prescription to a school rather than an individual. So again, this is why the guidelines now recommend trying to disseminate this information as much as possible. I don't want this in any way to scare you from implementation because you know, you're, you're learning about the law and exactly what should be done and you have resources on this panel who can, can help you out if you run into any trouble. But if we can work to um, get this information out prior to implementation, it certainly will save you some, some headache. I also wanted to talk about um, another thing that we did with our data is we looked at um, where um, these schools were located and how much they used the inhaler to try to determine whether uh, this metric, which is called an area deprivation index, which ranks neighborhoods by their socioeconomic status and disadvantage. We tried to see whether schools who were in these um, very disadvantaged areas were more likely to use the stock inhaler than schools that were not. And we've used the school address and census block to determine this ADI measure for each school. This is a standard measure that's available um, at this website um, and is put together by um, HRSA and the University of uh, Wisconsin. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention has a very um, similar measure that could be used, but we um, chose to use this one. And when we did this analysis, we used our same population for that, that year. We had 228 schools that we looked at. And you can see the percentage of schools in each ADI quarter. So this, these are the schools that had the, the most or the greatest deprivation, meaning they were the lowest socioeconomic status, 17% of schools. Then we had 31% in the moderate deprivation, 25% low uh, deprivation, and 28%, which would be considered kind of higher income schools. So a pretty good distribution of schools in our area. But what we found is that schools that were in this moderate deprivation era quartile were about two times more likely to report using the stock inhaler, and they used it two times more frequently. So this was a little surprising to us because we really thought that maybe if it was going to be used more frequently, it might be in this lowest income uh, quartile, but it, it was not. It was in this. And so after going back and talking to the school, some of the things that we found is that you know, families in these lower income schools were more likely to be eligible for state sponsored insurance like Medicaid, um, and they were more able to get a second inhaler um, to come to school, uh, to, to bring to school. But it was really these families in this moderate deprivation area where they had they might have to rely on private insurance, but they had high copays and high out of pocket costs, which really um, decrease their access to an inhaler, particularly a second one for school. So, you know, it wasn't the lowest income, but actually, you know, what we would call more working class individuals, but who are struggling with high co-pays. And why is this important? Well, I think in mean, thinking about how to implement and where to start with implementation, um, you know, health equity and health, health justice remains an important priority for school-based programs. 
And some states, Illinois being one of those states, are choosing to start implementation in school districts with the highest rates of asthma or in these areas of high deprivation um, just for these reasons, because they realize that these may be some of the schools that have the highest need. Um, I'm a strong advocate that um, stock inhalers benefit every child, no matter whether they're rural, urban, high income, low income. I was the um, band booster president for four years at um, um, my, one of my son's school, and it's a, a high income district, but we benefited greatly from the stock inhaler because even though most of these kids had a second inhaler, when they actually had an asthma attack during band practice, that inhaler might have been two miles away on a bus where from where we were practicing, it might be in the locker room. And so having the stock inhaler, I think benefits all kids. But if you're having to make choices in terms of as a state, where to start with implementation, you know, this is something that you could consider. Um, Dr. Boloman talked about the standing orders or the protocols. Um, we in Arizona had a, a statewide protocol that all schools were using. Illinois is doing that as well. It can be modified by the schools, but we were finding that most schools just wanted to use the, the, the standing order that we had approved at the state level um, because it had a lot of buy-in from um, specialists and primary care practitioners. And this, our protocol called for four actuations or four puffs for mild to moderate respiratory distress, and then eight puffs for severe respiratory distress. We didn't use the range that you normally see of like two to four or four to eight um, because we um, had very few nurses in our schools. And we found that the range was very confusing for our non-licensed personnel. They were like, well, what does that mean? Do I get two? Do I get three? Do I get four? I, I'm not sure. And so because albuterol is so incredibly safe, um, we erred on the side of more actuations rather than fewer. So this is our, our protocol, and that will be in, become important in a minute when I show you some of our data. And as um, in our event logs, this is one of the reasons that it's important to record the total number of puffs and have that data available so that you can be looking at this data af um, after, afterwards. So we had those total number of puffs. And then what we did is we went in and we examined compliance to the protocol um, ranging from zero to 100% at school. So um, since we had four actuations for mild to moderate or eight actuations for severe respiratory distress, if the total number of puffs was not div divisible by four, then it clearly was not in compliance with the protocol. And so we looked at our about a thousand events that we had um, during that school year. And one of the disappointing things that we found is that only 28% of our um, stock inhaler events were compliant with the protocol. Um, one of the interesting things we found is that non-compliant events were more common at middle schools um, and they were least common at elementary schools. The other thing we were very interested in because we have very few um, licensed nurses in our schools is to look at um, compliance among schools by staff experience. Were they unlicensed assisted personnel? Um, were they school nurses or were they nurse supervised staff? Meaning that there was a nurse at the school but this was an unlicensed person that was administering the medication. And we found that there were no differences in compliance um, depending on staff experience, which was surprising to us. 66% um, of our non-compliant events led to a student receiving two puffs of medication instead of the required four. So it was tend to be in these mild to moderate where people gave less medica medication than the protocol required. And given that most of these events were not severe respiratory distress and that 84% of the kids, you know, end up returning to class, we feel like the non-compliance might have resulted from the school staff thinking about this traditional two to four puffs and, and erring on the low side. We also, in talking to school health staff, you know, um, some of them did say that. They said, well, we're used to the two to four puffs and we, we went with two puffs instead of four puffs, not understanding that um, this protocol is law. And so you must do it exactly as the protocol says. Um, the other thing we found out is that the protocol compliance was highest among elementary school students and lowest among middle and high school students. And so what our school health staff were saying is that these adolescents were saying, I don't want to take anymore. Two puffs is fine. That's what I take. I take two puffs. And so we've been working to deal with that, whether, and this kind of has differed a little bit by each school, whether documentation of refusal 
is allowed. Um, and you know, whether can the adolescent refuse the dose? I think they can. It's pretty hard to make a child do something they don't want to. Um, but then documenting um, very well, and then also following up with the parent that hey, our protocol said four. Your child would only take two. We want to let you know and make sure that that's documented very well. And so I think this has some implications when you're thinking about implementation because adherence to the protocol is important. It's a physician's order. Um, we have to, um, we don't get to make decisions about it. We have to, uh, you know, follow it exactly as it's written. And it has some legal liability if it's not followed as written. I will say we had absolutely no bad events in any of the students, even though we only had 28%, um, you know, compliance with the protocol. So this is more of a a theoretical issue than a real safety issue, but still um, it is something that's really important to pay attention to. Um, and then of course, you know, safety of the student. We wanna make sure that we are giving them enough medication or that we're not giving them too much medication. So I think all of, I tell you this only to have you think about how training has to include information on the importance of adherence to the protocol. I don't think we stress that enough in our initial, initial training. And I think some other states have had this issue as well. And then also to make sure that the school staff understand the difference between the stock inhaler protocol and the child's personal inhaler protocol. So if the child has their personal inhaler, they follow the asthma action plan that their physician has written. But if they're using the stock inhaler, they have to follow the stock inhaler protocol, no matter what that child's personal asthma action plan says, because the um, the prescription and the protocol for the stock inhaler um, follows that standing order. So they may be different. And that was a little confusing, I think, for staff at first before we explained that, you know, one protocol goes with one inhaler. <clears throat> and then again, as I mentioned, discussion on how to properly document um, when a student refuses prescribing doses. Just to give you a little um, sense of something slightly different, we've started implementation in Maricopa County, which is where Phoenix is. Um, in Arizona. So this is much, much larger than Pima County. And here we used in-person training, but we also had a public health nurse who reviewed each stock inhaler event, event. So the county was very involved in this. And each time a stock inhaler event was reported, the um, public health nurse at the health department reviewed it and discussed it with the schools. Um, as you can see, only 12% of schools are participating in this program, mainly because it's been very intensive and expensive for the health department. So they've intentionally kept it kind of small right now. But they, um, they've had similar outcomes to what we had, except in one area. So 43% of their schools reported at least one stock inhaler, 79% of the events are in children with diagnosis, and 78% of the events resulted in the student being sent back to class, which is very similar to what we found in Pima County. The one really big difference, as you can see, their adherence to protocol was 77%. And so we truly believe this was because they had a public health nurse reviewing each event. So they were only a non-compliant one time because then she was able to explain why you had to follow the order, um, why it was written as it was. Um, and again, we found the same thing that 82% of the non-compliant events were, were two puffs instead of four puffs. So people were underdosing rather than overdosing, which, um, turned out not to have any bad events, but it could be um, if that child continued to get worse and you had only given two puffs of medication instead of four puffs, you know, there's some safety issues for the child as well as legal liability for the school for not following the protocol. So kind of in conclusion, just thinking about implementation strategies that I've seen um, across, the, uh, across the U.S., there's just the online toolkit where you put everything online and you make it known to schools that it's available. Um, we've seen very low adoption with this because it takes a lot of um, energy for schools to get started and they really need some help getting started. There's really no data on fidelity to the protocol. I would imagine it would be relatively low, but it is low cost. It's one way to do things. You put it out there and you say, this exists, um, go for it schools. But we've seen very, very low adoption that way. The other way is kind of a, a medium, um, you know, um, approach, which we did in, in the Tucson or Pima County area, which is to have the online toolkit and then provide either web-based or in-person training. This leads to pretty high program adoption when we uh, provide training, um, but we found that we had low fidelity to the protocol. So I, I'm hoping that our training is now better and maybe that our, our fidelity to the protocol or you know, following the protocol is going to be better. Um, but you know, that remains to be seen. We don't have data on that yet. And it's kind of in the medium cost area. 
And then I say, you know, a higher cost approach would be what um, the Maricopa County or Phoenix is doing. They have the toolkit, they have the training, um, but then they have this coaching that happens after each stock inhaler event. Um, they, they've had very low adoption because it's been expensive for them to do, but they have very high fidelity to the protocol because it's very costly. I really believe that this somewhere in the middle is the way to go and that we've just learned now how to better do education. Um, I'm also a firm believer that in-person education is really important when a school is doing this for the first time. Being able to hold the inhaler, the spacer, being able to ask questions if somebody um, is whether that in-person is a, a live virtual event or whether it's actually at the school, I think that's incredibly important. I think the web-based training that's asynchronous is perfect and fine once the school gets going and they're just kind of relearning or doing their training again. So in conclusion, how are you gonna do implementation statewide? I think there's a variety um, of ways that people have done it. I mean, I always suggest the low hanging fruit way, which is to, to go to the districts that are interested. Maybe it's the school districts with a nurse because there's somebody there that can actually lead, um, you know, somebody where you have known points of contact, where it's a physician, a health department, a superintendent, somebody that's really interested um, in implementing this program. But I also think there's a lot of um, a lot to be said for implementing in the high asthma burden or the areas that have more socioeconomic dis disadvantage, that that is certainly another way to go. And so I think there are many ways that you can choose to do implementation statewide, but understanding that it's going to take time. We started in the 2017 school year, and I would say we probably still have less, less than 50 percent of schools around our state implementing. So I will stop there and turn it back over to Leslie um, for discussion or questions. You're still muted, Leslie. Yeah, got it. And um, I'm going to go ahead and advance on through here. And I am going to spend some time before we go into the questions. Um, talking about what we've been doing up in um, Tarrant County and the Asthma 411 initiative there. Um, I want to mention a little bit that we go back with the unassigned albuterol in a framework to improve asthma outcomes that really goes back, and, and this draws on experience that goes back to 2002. And when we look at this period, of course, a ton of things have changed, and there's a few things that haven't changed as well. So when we got started, um, or when this model got started, it was about the CDC recognizing that best practices in asthma management were great, but they were really hard um, to implement com comprehensively. And I think put it in the things that haven't changed bucket. Um, they started with a conversation with school nurses in St. Louis and said, what do you most need to make this happen? And the school nurses said, you know, we're working with asthma action plans, we're working with asthma uh, education, and we don't have the bandwidth, another thing that hasn't changed. But there's one problem we'd really like to solve, and that's getting quick relief medication on our campuses for kids when they have trouble breathing. And what we need for that is standing delegation orders, and we need a consulting physician. Over the six years of this CDC grant that really emerged as a key component of their asthma initiative. And that's where we have kind of carried that forward. And it has remained a key component, not the only component, but the key component as we've moved across this next 20 year period. Um, and about 10 years ago, uh, the lead for the St. Louis initiative came to the Health Science Center. We adapted all of those tools and used them here for two years on two campuses. We built this um, with our community support based on good outcomes, a consortium um, that we'll talk about a little more. And we've been working since then to expand out. A lot of different pieces go along with the stock albuterol, but I'll just note that we can really group all of these into the focus on the emergency response when children have trouble breathing, 
information that includes education, outreach, the professional development, and the links to resources and partnerships. So let's get a little bit into the outcomes. What has happened as we've been working with implementation um, on last year, 300, over 350 campuses, 353. The one thing that you'll see over here on uh, the left side is that that pie chart looks an awful lot like the one that Dr. Gerald sent. And I think that that is very interesting. Um, I'm not putting numbers here, which have fluctuated across the pandemic and whatnot, um, but really it's been very consistent as far as this large percentage, 80 to 85% of kids who can go back to class, safely complete their day, um, 15 to 20% with early dismissal to the parent for same day care, less than 2% in any given year, and usually well under 2% that end up with an EMS call. So what do we do with some of that information? I'm, I have on our right side a few ways to think about that, both for your district and for engaging support around this concept. The first is that I've taken our most recent numbers and tried to generate best estimates on best available um, impacts of, of doing this within the school system. And I'd be happy to talk to folks about that methodology and see how we can um, further improve that. But we can estimate last that in 21-22, there were 3,375 additional instructional hours provided because of those children who could go back and safely complete their day. That we estimate conservatively 482 um, addition, absences that were avoided and an economic impact that saving um, the based on the ADA for the schools of over $27,000. Um, reducing the school day asthma related EMS, again, using that 20% number, which is our best available ev evidence um, from Dr. Gerald, we estimate 230 reduced EMS calls in $345,000, and then a very conservative estimate on how this may have benefited um, families in the workplace in terms of reducing work absences. Bottom line, economic impact of $446,000. Now, that far outweighs when we look at what is the actual cost in supplies, about $50 to $60 per campus um, per year. Um, again, that's not the coordination and the effort with that. Um, but Clearly, if we could have a tiny fraction of this uh, go back to school health services and support, uh, we would be able to cover this very nicely. Now, I wish we could do that, we can't, but what we can do is share this information with those stakeholders in the community that can bring those resources where they need to be. So bring those instructional hours and absence days into your school administrators can make a huge difference. In our beginning years, we were also able to get academic outcomes, and we could show them that with their students and their test scores, there was a three to five percent increased odds of failing grade level standards with every one of those absence days. Now, they know that's an academic risk, but seeing it in their students engaged them in a very different way. We've also brought this to some of our local officials and elected officials. Um, judge Jean Whitley was our county judge and it was very powerful in engaging him to build our collaboration. We also do an annual nursing survey at the end of every year. And I'll bring in some information from 21-22. We're not quite ready with the new year. Um, we get about an 80% response rate, and we are so grateful for every nurse that responds because we try to improve our programs every year based on that feedback. Overwhelmingly, people are satisfied and describe the program as manageable or very manageable. And the majority of these are very satisfied, very manageable. I don't have the qualitative comments here, but so many nurses have said this has been a tremendous benefit. I wish it was available for every school. Um, it's gone down a little bit 
as the requirements for documentation uh, have gotten more burdensome. And we can see that when we ask about challenges, number one challenge is completing the documentation. Um, the second one is the difficulty connecting with parents. And we know that's tough um, because when you're starting to work with those parents, you're starting to get into that very difficult issue of why don't all the kids have what they need? Um, and that's a really hard problem to solve. The one thing I'll say about the documentation, we've worked on tools to streamline this and make it as easy as possible, though it's still hard. Um, one of the one, the one small thing with this last legislative session, I wish had been a little different, is that documentation was moved from the rules and the administrative code into the legislation. I want to assure my partners at Tarrant County, those hardworking nurses, that was not my idea, um, nor was it on anybody else's who is part of this team. And if there's something we may need to go back to and try to address, it's that. A last point I'll make, because we have some people as they implement ask, are parents going to be okay with this, or are they going to be um, unhappy that for somebody was giving them this medication? Everybody who says that they receive feedback have said that it's positive. Um, again, the few people that say positive instead of very positive are, as we've moved um, away from nebulizers, there's parents who want a nebulizer instead, and we no longer make that. And we have parents who say, do you really need to contact me every single time this is used? And the answer is, well, yes, we do. Um, so let's go forward. I want to say, how can we make this happen for 350 um, school campuses? Well, by not doing it alone. It's been by our partnership. And as I mentioned, um, our county judge stepped forward when he saw the outcomes of a pilot program and brought us all together. So we have our partners here, Cook Children's and JPS, that will speak briefly um, at the end. They've done a fantastic job, all of us really working together. And it's been such a joy and a privilege to see this emerge. Cook Children's within our service area and those who have been able to to, uh, willing to sign um, a memorandum of understanding for evaluation purposes has been providing the medication supplies and pharmacy and an annual professional development symposium that's available to everyone. In fact, their general school nurse uh, symposium, I believe, is tomorrow, and you could probably still sign up for that on their website. But they also annually provide one specifically for school asthma. JPS has done a wonderful job. When the question was uh, came up, what do we do if we don't have a consulting physician? JPS stepped forward and, and Dr. Jay Haynes and Dr. Shelley Sexton um, now have said, yes, we will step into that role. And not only signing those standing delegation orders, but finding forming um, a medical advisory council now that has two pediatricians from each of our three institutions that review annually best available evidence, what's changed and come up and what are our outcomes. And then Safer Care Texas with some tailored implementation um, support and tools, which is what I'm going to talk about now. I'm going to just speak for a second, and then I'm going to ask um, our communication manager to actually go to the website. I know we're going over one o'clock, uh, but we're in our question and answer, and I just want to take a few moments here. Um, Safer Care Texas, the mission is eliminate preventable harm. It's a state-supported um, initiative, and fortunately, they, as I do, see this as very much aligned. When we estimate in Texas, there may be 350,000 uh, students with current asthma and no access to their own quick relief medication, this is a patient safety issue. Um, their work being health health literacy, patient safety, nursing, CH, uh, community health workers, but we also have partnerships that include uh, medical and biostatistics consultation and this wonderful Department of Academic Innovation with media production that's worked on our supplies. Um, we have the website and I'm going to stop sharing and ask ask Leslie Reyna to go ahead and open um, the website so that we can just take a moment to look at some of those together and go to the Nurses and Health Administration, first of all, um, because until May 22nd, uh, that's the only group that could administer. We've had a CNE. Um, version 4.0 is underway 
And our target is to make this launch on August 8th, which is when folks are coming back to campus for their uh, professional education um, time. And go on down to, we divide our resources into these three big buckets here, administering the recommendations, the follow-up and documentation, and general asthma emergencies. Please start first with administering quick relief medicines. Terrific. Um, I'm going to, we have a standing delegation order that has evolved across this 20 year period from a one page document and then updated annually review. Um, anybody can download this as a template and use it with consultation that you may have in your area. Uh, we'd be happy to discuss all of these references. You could go to ASMA 411 now and they are free. You can download them, you can adapt them, but we hope we have collaboration so we can understand and get feedback to include um, support for that. We have a delegation order algorithm. Maybe uh, Leslie could open that one in the middle very, very quickly. This is our patient safety people who work in that area. This may look familiar, who take that complex document and have put it into a, um, our advanced practice nurses into a protocol for us. Uh, Leslie, if you could go back and we'll just show a very brief clip about the first minute of um, an asthma a light air training video um, that, that is also available. I'll keep going. Um, I do think that that may be helpful to show people if you can scroll down a little bit, um, you'll see the light air training video. Just let's watch that for about 30 seconds. It's the one, one over from the right. This is one of our advanced practice patient safety nurses um, along with her son. And we're not gonna listen to it, but she is a, does this demonstration, talks through it. Uh, you can see we've created this during the COVID pandemic because it not only includes the light air spacer, but all of the COVID precautions that were necessary at this time. She's looking to make sure there's nothing in there, uh, shaking it the appropriate amount of time, et cetera. And then we'll walk um, the student through the use. So in the interest of time, Leslie, we can stop that because it is, again, uh, this is Kate's wonderful son who actually has asthma. You can see he was wearing a, a mask because that was during the pandemic. But if we can go on back, there's one last thing. I'd like to go ahead and switch out of this one um, and go, if you can go back one to the mandated follow-up and documentation. We have letters for parents that nurses said, we need a form that tells parents what happened today. And Leslie, if you'll sc scroll up just a little bit, you'll see that we have these in five different languages. Um, these are the five languages that um, people told us they most needed. So we have a frequently asked question, your child received medication today, what does that mean? Um, we also have checklists and a number of other things we hope you might find uh, useful. So thank you with that. If you could give it back to me, I'm gonna wrap it up and we'll open our, our question and answer. Um, there's just a couple of items that I want to emerge from our experience as having been especially important. And that is, as we get through here, who champions can make a huge difference and who can those be? They may be you, each person who's on this call, but you can also identify champions within your school district and within your community. Collaboration is key. It has been for us. I know it is for others. Reach out. You will find there are people who are willing to help you help children breathe. It's been one of the great privileges and, and uh, pleasure for me to be able to work with this wonderful group of people. Collaboration is key because the unmet healthcare needs are really in part what we're touching on. And schools and or any one of us, clinicians or other community groups can't do this alone. And evaluation and data is the fuel for the car that moves us all forward. Um, it's a journey and it can sometimes, uh, rather than a destination, as we try to continue our work for improving asthma outcomes. And sometimes that road is a little more complicated and we feel more like this. Um, but I am so grateful for everyone who's here and working together. Um, you can contact any one of these uh, afterwards, the website, the email, or me. 
Um, we do have had some gaps where our email wasn't always as well monitored. That is changing now. And if you send your questions to this asthma 411 at UNT Health Science Center, we'll be monitoring that on a consistent basis and try to connect you with whatever resources we're aware of. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over uh, to our wonderful Dr. Uh, Folashade Afalave uh, to monitor for our remaining discussion and Q&A. Thank you. Hi. Hi, this was wonderful. This was absolutely amazing. I was wondering if Dr. Sexton is actually on and available because we had one question that I had specifically for her, but I don't know if she's still here. I don't see her. There, there she is, and she's raising her hand. There she comes, Dr. Sexton. So um, one of the big questions that I had, and I'll answer the questions in the q and I'll ask those questions in the Q&A as well, is um, how do you find a consulting physician? Um, and how do you get these medicines and, and supplies? Um, and Dr. Sexton, you're a pediatrician and chair of the Asthma 411 Medical Advisory Council. And so you are an expert um, in this role as a consulting physician. So we'd love your input. Sure. Um, so I, um, I, I think this is to tell me again, so I make sure that I'm answering the question correctly. Remind me. So yeah, so the big question is how do you find a consulting physician? So for those places that have um, are challenged to find a consulting physician, um, do you know of any resources to be able to find a consulting physician or any resources for those physicians who wish to be a consulting physician as well? I'm, I'm letting myself be, be seen. Yeah, so can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot easier than that it can seem, um, especially from the, you know, being a perspective if I was a school nurse or even a concerned parent um, and, you know, with my school district, whether that's, you know, going, going to one of public school or private schools, I think really just being, um, being willing to ask the question, um, you know, I'm on forums, I'm a mom myself, I've got four kiddos, um, and, you know, with, I, I, you know, I, we're on social media too. We, we know we're all human in you know, human beings. And um, there are moms that are out there serving as consulting physicians for their kids, you know, private schools for their, their kiddos is local um, school district, um, you know, reaching out to, to, to the resources that are, you know, closest or even most familiar. And you, you, um, I think the language that we were saying is you might be surprised at how actually excited and, and uh, we would, um, we feel, you know, a sense of uh, belonging and responsibility. And it's, it's quite an honor to, to be involved in the process. The okay, go ahead. No, sorry. You touched on the medication question and how, to, and how does all of that work? Um, and I think Dr. Gerald touched on that as well. Um, you know, does your lo is your local pharmacy aware of, uh, you know, statutes and, um, and I think that, you know, for us, you know, I was so fortunate to already be, you know, a, a part of a collaborative program where, you know, Cooks has been so generous to, you um, to provide those resources for us and um, as well as uh, personnel and support to make all of those steps happen. Um, but it, it also, it doesn't have to be that complicated either. Um, you know, I live in Granbury, okay? So if you're familiar with Texas, it's not, it's not the tiniest town, but it's also not the biggest. And we've got local pharmacies and, you know, and, and those pharmacists, they have kids too. And I think just, it, there's a lot of power in, in a conversation. Um, and I think sometimes in the digital age, we, we at times forget that. But yeah, just, just taking the ask. And, um, and then as Leslie communicated, um, you know, getting grassroots um, stakeholder, you know, people involved who is in your, who is in your area that, um, you know, that has an interest, you know, whether that's one of the 
um, you know, you know, whether that's a local lesion group, you know, who's in your area that, you know, is in, is investing in the community. Sometimes they're just looking for money to give away (laughs) and we just don't know about it. So, but in any case, that's, that's where I would start. That's really, really helpful looking um, to those people that are close by and just asking the questions to those invested people um, in your local area to make this happen. And speaking of the resources that are available um, in Fort Worth, um, I wanted to talk to um, Dr. Bernard, who is a director of child wellness at Cook Children's Health um, Healthcare System. And your system um, at this point seems to provide quite a few resources. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit um, about how Cooks came to the decision to provide those resources and how operationally that works. Sure. So thank you so much for having us here. Um, It's been a pleasure working with Leslie and um, the Health Science Center on this um, consortium over the past several years. Um, And um, Cook came to the table before I was um, in this role and involved. Um, But as part of that collaborative process, um, you know, Judge Whitley convened Cook uh, Children's, who's always been um, wanting to give back to the community. uh, he convened our department, which is our community outreach department, essentially, of our healthcare system. Uh, so we are already primed um, to look for those opportunities to improve children's health out in the community. Uh, but they knew we had a retail pharmacy um, and folks who understand that there are these larger community needs um, that we all need to address together. Uh, so Cook was on board from the beginning, um, to my understanding. And um, at the time I came on, I am... I, I was part of some conversations where they engaged with our pharmacy um, leaders and our risk management um, and our other physician champions and advisors uh, to make sure they all knew and understood that, yes, this is a thing that happens. This is the law. This is the best practices. So those conversations started up front. So um, and that really helped, I think. Um, with any resistance or hesitancy um, from our organization as a whole to participate, uh, because once people heard that, they were on board. And oh yes, of course. Uh, once they knew that all these protocols and um, regulations were in place, uh, so since then our pharmacy um, works closely with Dr. Sexton and the other consulting physicians as they sign the standing delegated orders and write the prescriptions for the stock medication that goes straight to our pharmacy. Uh, and then our pharmacy fills it. And um, unbeknownst to me, even they have budget line items for um, community work like this. So again, you never know until you ask where where money might be living. Um, but our pharmacy uh, will fill those prescriptions. Um, before COVID, we also worked with our home health department with for nebulizers and the masks and tubing, um, all of that. Uh, and then um, we're, we're fortunate that my team um, within the Center for Community Health is able to then um, take those medication and supplies from our pharmacy and then hand deliver them to each of our districts. Uh, and then those get disseminated by district as they need to. Um, In addition to the medication and supplies, you saw also um, we work with our education department to provide annual in-service for school health staff around school asthma care. We do this in partnership with um, the other folks on the consortium to figure out what um, topics and get the right speakers because we all have um, um, phenomenal content experts to bring to the table. So um, we we make sure that in addition to the standard training that happens at the beginning of every school year that um, Dr. Alsop's team manages uh, for the participating districts. We have this um, annual staff development as a supplement to enhance. Sounds like a wonderful program that really is providing a valuable resource, um, not only in the physical medications that are needed, but in that that key component of education. And Dr. Vollerman, there was a question about, um, there's several questions in the chat about how do we train these unlicensed personnel and how do we get them to recognize the difference between respiratory distress, you know, requiring albuterol and versus that um, requiring epi. And then for those people that don't have access to a school nurse in more rural locations, how do we train these unlicensed personnel? So I didn't know if you had any insight into that with your progress with your um, process in Illinois. 
Yeah, so in Illinois, we actually, um, through a community group and with partnering physicians, created a statewide training that is available to, um, through the Illinois State Board of Education um, that any that any school um, can use throughout the state of Illinois. Um, and then um, that really allows, you know, creates equity in terms of the access to that training. Um, and, um, and then what we've encouraged is um, individuals locally to then be available, right? So a school nurse or um, may not be able to put on the entire training um, because they don't have the time or the resources to do so. But once that training, once a person completes training through a webinar or through a training system that either a local school nurse or uh, an, um, a nurse in the state that is familiar with the state regulations um, is available just to talk through and to kind of answer questions um, be there as a resource, right? And for ESMA 411, that team could potentially serve as that resource. It may not need to be um, a local school nurse piece, but um, that can be a really helpful piece. But I think leveraging technology and the possibilities of technology to um, you know, really create equity in terms of that training is a really important piece. So it sounds like you have a warehouse through the Department of, of, of through the, through the schools um, or the Department of Education, that's really helpful. Um, we don't have that um, resource and we have a hard stop in four minutes, but what we do have is asthma 411 as a resource. Um, and Dr. Alsop, she showed us some of the um, of the um, website that you have, but there's some, some more questions about the website and additional resources and more in-depth resources, which I believe are on asthma 411. So I just wanted you to comment on that. So I, I'm not sure what the question specifically, but the you big know, question is there's a plethora of resources on asthma 411. How do we access those um, um, those those resources? And if there's more in-depth questioning or issues, what are the next steps? Absolutely. Thank you so much for clarifying. So asthma411.org, you can go there and you can see all of those resources. Just download them. Um, they're PDFs, but you can adapt them, um, and they're available for you to use. Now, my goal, my vision, my hope, dream is that we can stay in contact, and then you see something that's going to work better, that you can share that back to us, um, and that we find other ways where we can partner with ALA and TSNO and uh, Department of State Health Services so that we are continuously strengthening the resources for folks across the state. But they are there, they're available. Um, all of those different languages, uh, they're there. And um, please feel free to, to explore. Contact us, use that email or mine, asthma411 at unthsc.edu. Um, we'll have that monitored very carefully, especially this summer. And if your question, for example, is, is with um, Dr. Barnard about their pharmacy services and you didn't have her contact, We'll look at that and we will, um, or you had a question with Becca Harkle Road and TSNO or Charlie at ALA, et cetera, we'll, we'll be monitoring that to try to make those connections. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been an excellent, excellent um, uh, forum. And what I think is really important is that this is a forum. Um, and so we really want to be able to work together in the future so that we can really extend this uh, unassigned albuterol for all kids so that it is equitable and that kids in rural um, locations um, have, have the access to, to get this training um, in, you know, all over the state of Texas. And so hopefully we'll have more input. We'll have more more organizing so that this is something that's on a more global scale. Um, and because there are quite a few um, uh, questions about replacing expired inhalers um, and more detailed questions about the state law. Um, uh, and, and one of the questions, and more questions about the state law. And I think we can answer those in more robust ways in other forums and other meetings. And we do have a week, we do have a meeting um, that if you're interested in being a part of, um, please um, email Dr. Alsops or, um, it, or, or, or um, email asthma411 to be a part of that as well. We will continue to be uh, meeting this summer. 
Uh, usually it's been Wednesday at 4.30 and we'll see what the response is and it's based on need at least once a month, sometimes uh, twice a month. So please let us know if you're interested in joining that conversation. That's where we're going to go forward and see how can we best mobilize uh, resources to support um, dissemination of unassigned albuterol, but also to, um, to support uh, improved asthma outcomes for children. I'm so grateful for everybody. We know that it's 1.30 and we're going to wrap it up. Um, our communications manager may just post two last polls that if you are choose to, you can answer on your way out. But other than that, we'll close our, our uh, forum today with a huge thank you uh, to all of our speakers, all of our presenters, and all of those who have worked on the initiative all of you who have made the time today to join us and to work every day uh, to pr improve the health of children. Thank you. Uh, We'll consider the form as officially over at 131, um, but we'll leave this poll and we'll leave this open until we have a chance for people to enter their results and we start to uh, see that slowing down. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wollerman. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Thank you, Dr. Alsops. And thank you so much, Leslie Reyna. We really appreciate all your help. Thank you. Bye, thank you all. Bye-bye.